welcome all the delegates to our today's symposium on onco rehabilitation in the era of non communicable diseases lifestyle plays a crucial role in reducing morbidity and improving quality of life every day there are advancements in the field of cancer management but there are numerous impairments and limitations faced by these patients it necessitates a comprehensive approach towards capacity building of these patients that is onco rehabilitation for this symposium i request dr t v anasekar to chair the session he is a renowned name in the field of onco physiotherapy he has worked in the field of onco rehab nationally and internationally currently he is director of grace physiotherapy and rehabilitation center chennai we are pleased to have you uh, chairing this session sir thank you so much and over to you good morning all uh, pleasant to see you all here and uh, first starting with uh, the first speaker dr chakur sunil vora young and dynamic medical profession a post graduate in uh, general medicine from uh, saint gs medical college and completed his uh, super specialization from uh, medical medical oncology from tata memorial he has established his oncology day care unit at uh, sasun general hospital pune and uh, is the director of uh, retinas cancer center i welcome you sir so he will be uh, taking the first session over to you sir uh thank you uh, dr dinesh sir uh good morning all i'll just start sharing my screen and uh is the screen uh, visible to all dr uh, anish kar yeah it's uh, loading sir yeah it is visible now okay yeah uh good morning everyone uh, i thank the organizers to give me an opportunity to discuss this very important aspect of cancer patient care uh, with all of you uh, basically my role will be to discuss the problems faced by our patients from cancer diagnosis during cancer treatment and further towards uh, cancer survivorship as well so uh, i am dr chakur vora i am a medical oncologist and uh, i am uh, i'll practicing in pune so and i'll be discussing cancer cancer treatment and just uh, initiate a talk on onco rehab so uh yeah so what is cancer now to define cancer there are multiple definitions the easiest one is to say that okay abnormal uh, cells start multiplying abnormal uh, cells of our body become abnormal they start multiplying in an uncontrolled manner and they uh, start growing and spreading in the body and cause deterioration of general health and if uh, unchecked they lead to the patient's death as well so this is just the very layman or very basic definition of cancer and many of us must be knowing someone or some other uh, or would have seen many patients who have undergone uh, treatment for cancer and have suffered at the end of uh, uh, suffered because of this disease what are the cancer treatments we all are aware about chemotherapy surgery and radiation therapy and the latest advances over the last 10 to 15 years or 20 years have been targeted therapies and immunotherapy just a word about immunotherapy so what is immunotherapy immunotherapy are basically medicines and vaccines and t cells of the uh, which are given to the patient with uh, in the injectable formulations and these medicines cause uh, the immune system of the patient to, to boost they boost the immune system and uh, activate the immune system to act against the cancer cells and destroy the cancer cells thus helping us control the cancer in a better way in a more uh, natural way as compared to chemotherapy or surgery or radiation or radiation therapy uh on the other hand what is targeted therapy so targeted therapy has evolved over the last 20 years from the year 2000 2001 we have now almost 200 or more uh, targeted therapies available in different different and different uh in the wide spectrum of multiple malignancies targeted therapies have been developed with the help of research and advances in the field of genetics so now we identify multiple uh, mutations multiple 
uh, uh, genetic alterations in cancer cells, which are the drivers for these cancer cells, which are the drivers for multiplication. For example, the epidermal growth factor receptor, which is seen in, uh, which is uh, hyperactivated, or there are mutations in the EGFR receptor in multiple, in almost 30 to 40 percent of our lung cancer patients. And just an inhibitor molecule like erlotinib or osimertinib wow. or ceftinib, this single simple one tablet per day can help control the patient's cancer for years together. Median survivals of, for lung cancer patients today have expanded to three years to five years, even in metastatic setting, in the stage four lung cancer patient. Just a few years back, lung cancer would have meant a death sentence within six months. But now our patients are able to live for five years, six years, and some of them are living even 10 years or more. So the, this is how targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and advances in the cancer treatment have helped in the in expanding or extending the survivals of our patient and at the same time improving the quality of life. So just the goal of all this treatment, all these treatment modalities put together in one sentence is to improve the quality of life, daily function uh, of our patients and also the duration of life of the patient. But while doing this, are we just doing it without any harm? Absolutely no. What are the adverse effects? The adverse effects of all these treatment modalities, especially the chemo and immuno and targeted therapies can be uh, clubbed into two uh, subgroups, the early side effects and the late side effects or late adverse effects. Early side effects, we all know many of the chemotherapeutic agents cause cytopenias. They cause anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, and patients are at increased risk of multiple infections. Fatigue is one of the most commonest, uh, one of the most common uh, adverse effect of our treatments. Uh, and this we'll be discussing in more detail later. Musculoskeletal symptoms, mus myalgias, cramps, and uh, sarcopenia are uh, known to happen with treatments. Chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy is one of the most frequent adverse effects. Neurocognitive dysfunction, alopecia. So these are the acute side effects or early side effects. And we have multiple late uh, or chronic uh, toxicities also. And these chronic toxicities need to be taken care of. The acute toxicities are many times reversible. But the chronic side effects like cardiomyopathy. Patients, patient may become cancer-free, but if his uh, ejection fraction, if his cardiac function uh, uh, goes down to as low as 20-30%, then his daily functioning, even if he is cancer-free, will be very limited and the quality of life is altered or hampered. Similarly, is with uh, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. If a patient get, develops a grade 3 peripheral neuropathy, his, even walking for a few, uh, few meters or few blocks becomes difficult for that patient. And then what are we offering to our patient? So taking care of CIP and uh, a chronic uh, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy or even psychosocial uh, impact, which is seen on the, all these patients while they struggle or fight the cancer. These are important things that need to be discussed. And that's what we'll be discussing. So we'll be discussing today, uh, I'll be just covering uh, five major subgroups of um, uh, treatment or disease-related toxicities or issues faced by our patients. So first of these will be cardiotoxicities. Cardiotoxicity is seen in around 20 to 30 percent of patients receiving cancer treatment. Approximately one to five percent of patients will have severe cardiotoxicities in the form of severe arrhythmias or heart failures or uh, dilated cardiomyopathy or vasospastic angina or vasospasm vasoocclusion leading to myocardial infarction and some of the patients can also have pericardial disease. To give a few examples, anthracycline induced cardiomyopathy, anthracyclines, the doxorubicin, downorubicin, these drugs have been used for the last 40 years and uh, the cardiomyopathy with anthracyclines happens in around 3 to 5 percent of our patients. Especially the elderly are at a higher risk, the diabetics and the hypertensive patients or those who have had a myocardial infarct uh, in, the, in the earlier days before cancer diagnosis. So the, the anthracyclines which are commonly used in breast cancer treatment are known to cause cardiomyopathy mainly. HER2 targeted therapies, again one of the commonest, uh, it is used in around 30 to 40 percent of our breast cancer patients and uh, they uh, here but the only uh, better thing is that this cardiomyopathy by her two targeted therapies like trastuzumab and lapatinib is usually reversible while that with anthracyclines is usually irreversible 
the fluoropyrimidines this is a group of drugs like 5 fluorouracil and capecitabin so these drugs are commonly used in gi oncology in gi malignancies and these drugs are notorious to cause vasospastic angina and rarely it can even cause a myocardial infarction as well coming to the checkpoint inhibitors the immunotherapeutic drugs so these drugs we know that these can cause uh, in as i mentioned the mechanism of action the immunotherapy is known to activate the immune system of of the patient now immune system of the patient can also over uh, can be over activated and it can miss fire just don't 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 so the uh, the immune system of the patient may be overactivated it may misfire and cause inflammation of any part of the body especially it can cause pericarditis myocarditis or endocarditis and coming lastly to the targeted therapies the targeted therapies can also cause multiple issues with, uh, like arrhythmias they can cause qt prolongation an ecg finding and these can lead to supraventricular tachycardias so just this was in brief about the cardiotoxicity coming to the pulmonary toxicity pneumonitis interstitial lung disease pulmonary fibrosis uh, pulmonary thromboembolism these are the uh, toxicities which can be seen these are uh, uh, fortunately these are rare seen in around uh, 1 to 3% of the patients the drugs commonly causing these uh, toxicities bleomycin again a conventional chemotherapeutic drug is known to cause pneumonitis and later later pulmonary fibrosis immune therapy can cause pneumonitis in around 2 to 3% of the patients and it can be severe may need complete stopping of immunotherapy and they these patients may need high dose steroids also Uh, the other agents like thalidomide lenalidomide these uh, can cause a thrombophilic state and this can lead to throm- pulmonary thromboembolism uh, gemcitabine taxanes like docetaxel are known to cause pulmonary fibrosis as well the third group of toxicity is much more relevant than the initial two uh, with the discussion today are the neurotoxicities peripheral neuropathy if not uh, uh, can, is usually manifested in the form of sensory peripheral neuropathy the typical distribution is the glove and stocking distribution where patients complain of tingling or numbness sensation in the toes and fingers and if uh, overlooked or if not taken care of quickly or in the initial phases can uh, further progress to a motor peripheral neuropathy and that can be a very debilitating situation for the patient autonomic neuropathies are rare ototoxicity is known with cisplatin one of the platinum compounds again one of the initial uh, again one of the initial uh, chemotherapeutic agents which was discovered around 50 60 years ago encephalopathy is also fortunately very rare it uh, seen with ifosfamide or few other drugs uh, far- pharyngolaryngeal dysesthesia is a muscular spasm of the pharynx and laryngeal muscles which uh, happens is with oxaliplatin but can be taken care of with simple measures and myalgias are known to happen with taxanes and vinca alkaloids and eritrolin uh, even the newer agents like brentuximab vedetin and tdm1 which is trastuzumab emtansin these agents even though they are, these are the latest advances which have which we have which have, we have started using in the last 5 to 7 years but even these drugs are not uh, uh, completely safe these agents can also cause debilitating peripheral neuropathies coming to the uh, fourth subgroup of toxicities fatigue today dr anuradha will be discussing more on fatigue and fatigue management so uh, fatigue is one of the most common uh, toxicities or uh, common issues which our cancer patients face and approximately 70 to 85% of our patients do have fatigue at one point or the other during their uh, di- at the ti- at the onset of diagnosis or during the treatment and some of them even have uh, fatigue during the survivorship uh, 35% to 40% of patients will have severe fatigue and there are multiple contributor factors and it's not only about the drugs which we give it's not only about chemotherapy uh, th- therapy but cancer induced cachexia cancer related anorexia 
patients may have anemia it may be drug induced it may be chronic inflammatory anemia because of a uh, chronic chronic inflammatory state as we see in the uh, in our patients with uh, in our patients with cancer uh, drug induced mu uh, fatigue is also known mucositis diarrhea dyspepsia uh, these are also other causes also many of our cancer patients face depression and sleep disturbances and these are also contributing to fatigue which is seen in our patients coming to the last subgroup sarcopenia and cancer cachexia sarcopenia is a loss of uh, skeletal muscle mass cachexia is actually uh, a hypercatabolic state defined as accelerated loss of skeletal muscle in the context of a chronic inflammatory response now cancer cachexia is much worse than sarcopenia alone it is much more uh, Uh, debilitating for a patient than sarcopenia sarcopenia is seen with around uh, with a few drugs like sorafenib and palbocyclib or crizotinib and androgen deprivation therapy androgen deprivation therapy is again a hormonal therapy or it is it is a uh, way of uh, depriving or decreasing the testosterone levels in a patient by either orchidectomy or by giving uh, a high dose luprolide uh, which is uh, lhrh uh, agonist which causes decrease in the drop in the level of testosterone and as we know testosterone is one of the uh, hormones which uh, which keeps the muscle strength well in uh, in ma- males so androgen deprivation therapy sorafenib palbocyclib crizotin these are few of the examples which can cause sarcopenia in our patients cancer cachexia has multiple uh, uh, causes most most importantly it is the chronic inflammatory state which a cancer patient faces because of the cancer per se and the incidence of these in cancer patients is as high as 45 to 50% other relevant issues in cancer patients as we know cancer is a disease of the elderly and around 2/3 of our cancer patients are above 65 years or about 60 years of age so, so all of these are geriatric patients most of our patients are geriatric patients and they definitely need more care they are frail frailty is one of the issues with our cancer patients also they are uh, facing multiple other comorbidities someone some patients will have bone loss someone someone will be having diabetes someone will be having cardiac issues and some others may be having adverse body composition or renal diseases so multiple issues not just cancer or just cancer treatment but when we see a patient when we are treating a patient we need to take into consideration all these other factors as well so and many of these problems can be are amenable to onco rehabilitation interventions and what are these interventions these are not just medications these are not just counseling but medications counseling behavior changes promotion of healthy diets physical activity which will be discussing which which our other speakers will be discussing in more in depth as well as weight control or yeah and so these all symptoms should be assessed and treated from not only uh, once we start the treatment but from the diagnosis itself onco rehabilitation should be uh, integrated in the patient's management and patient care and so it should begin at the time of diagnosis and not somewhere in the end or at the end of diagnosis that we are referring the patient to a physiotherapist or an onco rehab center so uh, onco rehabilitation in short should be at the beginning and it should be throughout the cancer care thank you thank you dr chakor for our nice presentation and uh, the questions will be asked in the final session of it and now we will move on to the next topic and dr anuradha ma'am she will be dealing on uh, cancer related fatigue so dr anuradha ma'am has just now crossed her 30th uh, year in the field of onco rehabilitation in tata memorial so she is a pioneer in uh, tata and in the field of oncology and uh, she is the officer in charge of physiotherapy department in tata and she is also the founder member of society of onco physiotherapist and she is the she is currently the president of the society of onco physiotherapist in india uh, ma'am over to you uh, thank you dr gnana shekar and uh, thank you scientifica for giving me this opportunity to uh, take a part in this session and to share my experience with all of you i'll uh, share my screen now
um okay so as dr chakor just recently told us about uh, cancer related fatigue and it is one of the side effects of cancer therapy we will move on to have a little in depth knowledge about cancer related fatigue so to introduce cancer related fatigue it's a very complex and multi dimensional condition that involves environmental physical affective cognitive psychosocial and spiritual that means so many factors play a role when it comes to cancer related fatigue it may occur due to cancer due to the various treatment and sometimes it can be even at the end of the treatment and can last for months or even years together almost 80% of the cancer patients are affected due to fatigue at some point of the time during their treatment or at the initial diagnosis period itself it is distinct from the typical tiredness see when you talk about fatigue you there is a normal fatigue also a tiredness but cancer related fatigue is something a little different from it the main difference is that it does not get relieved by rest or sleep whereas a normal tiredness gets relieved by a rest or sleep and it also does not correspond to the patient's level of exertion or activity assessing fatigue is somewhere similar to a pain management assessment and it is a very subjective experience so it is just a patient's reported it's a patient reported outcome basically and it has shown to have a negative correlation with the quality of life and especially in the advanced stage or in the palliative stage and the four phases of management it initially starts with screening how to screen we will look into it the primary evaluation intervention and the reevaluation so the nccn has defined fatigue as a distressing persistent subjective sense of physical emotional and or cognitive tiredness or exhaustion related to cancer or cancer treatment that is not proportional to recent activity and interferes with the usual functioning what are the factors that affect cancer related fatigue so there are multiple factors that really play a role when it comes to cancer related fatigue so cancer itself it has got a lot of problems so the disease itself can manifest fatigue or there can be the treatment that is the radiotherapy chemotherapy which can also cause cause the side effect of fatigue and the different factors that are why because all these things in some way or the other it affects the sleep it affects the appetite of the patient it leads to anorexia cachexia hypothyroidism pain and along with that also there is something called as a very uh, psychological and social um, attitude or aptitude of fatigue which is the financial burden so this causes a lot of stress to the patient and because of the stress the stress induces a lot more changes in the patient and it affects the patient's treatment thereby causing fatigue so the mechanism when you look at the pathophysiology of uh, cancer related fatigue the cancer related fatigue has two uh, pathologies so it can be at the peripheral level that is at the muscular level or it can be at the central level at the cns level now at the muscular level basically it has got a decreased muscular contractile properties and that is because of the atp that is there in the muscle so the atp in cancer it is known that there is a decreased synthesis of atp because of the cachexia anorexia etc et also the disease itself it affects the protein metabolism and to some extent this atp cannot be replenished because due to the loss of vomiting and appetite the patient cannot have the energy intake and all these things can affect the peripheral that is why you have the loss of the muscle wasting and the loss of the muscle mass and this in some way or the other precipitates tiredness because you are not able to do perform physical activity at the central nervous uh, nervous system level there are different multiple factors the fatigue actually affects i mean the reasons that causes the cancer related fatigue one are the neurotransmitters so whenever cancer and cancer therapy is there it increases the neurotransmitter or the brain serotonin which this causes this uh, regulation and dysfunction in our circadian rhythm circadian rhythm is nothing but the biological clock that we see for 24 hour cycle and most of the times it is based on the cortisol uh, levels that is there in our body okay so cortisol has a it is a stress hormone and this causes a lot of changes in our body it affects a lot many things and we will see that and that is the reason why the circadian or basically the sleep rest activity gets gets disrupted 
how does this get uh, disrupted it is because of the increase in the cytokines now how do the cytokines increase in our body because whenever there is cancer and its treatment there is a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis dysregulation it is a regulatory system that mainly controls the regulation of the cortisol in our body so when this system gets disrupted you know the cortisol presence in our body decreases or increases as per the disruption now when there is a decreased cortisol cortisol has a suppressive effect on the cytokines that means basically it suppresses the production and the uh, increase of the cytokines in the body but when the hpa adrenal axis mechanism gets disrupted the site uh, the cortisol is decreased now this decreased cortisol cannot suppress and there is an increase in the cytokines or the pro inflammatory um uh, interleukins and the uh, tumor necrosis factors in our body increase and then that causes a lot of effect on our system and that is one of the leading cause of the cancer related fatigue so what are the common symptoms that you see so your symptoms are both physical as well as mental so you have physical fatigue which in which there is there can be there can be a pain there can be weakness there can be low or decreased physical activity and when it is a mental mental fatigue you can have attention deficit you can have no sh uh, short term memory loss lack of concentration so it is physical as well as a mental stress that you can see whenever there is a cancer related fatigue involvement there are different scales for assessing so the first point as we told we have to screen the patients how will you identify the patient has got a uh, cancer related fatigue now there are multiple tools that is seen here like you know there are n number of tools some are a uh, single item tool and some are multi dimensional single item tool basically it looks out for the fatigue in the uh, last 24 hours and it is basically from a 0 to 10 numeric scale and it is like our pain scale a was analog scale like you know how for pain we identify the same way you perceive fatigue with the last 24 hours then there are multi dimensional measures so multi dimensional measures like you have the revised piper fatigue scale and you have the profile of mood states fatigue and vigor subscale and so many i will not really go into the detail of it like you know because these are multi dimensional that means they not only assess the physical so they have a physical component they have a social component they have a spiritual component they have a psychological component so all these components are also evaluated and they normally look at fatigue for the last most of them look at the fatigue for the last week that means last 7 days fatigue is calculated and most of them are in a 4 point or a 5 point likert scale okay some of them are in the 11 and 11 point scale and a 10 point scale also okay i have only highlighted three things here because these are the three things we normally use in tata memorial hospital first thing second thing these are the three things that is commonly used in many of the studies that is there in fatigue and another thing is all these three are available in our indian languages okay so which is very important for when we look at our patients because you have all these three which are seen in you get it in hindi you get it in uh, marathi bengali and i think in tamil gujarati also so it is very important that you know you i have highlighted all these things so brief fatigue inventory is the most common and simplest mean of using it is a nine item thing which measures the fatigue in the last 24 hours and it is simply on a 0 to 10 scale so 0 that means there is no fatigue and 10 when you are totally exhausted facet which is the functional assessment of chronically ill therapy fatigue subscale okay that has got 13 items and it is specific to the symptoms it is validated questionnaire and it looks into the physical social emotional and functional well being okay and you have the fact an or the fact f like you know so the fact is functional assessment of cancer therapy f is a subscale fatigue subscale which is again specific to fatigue symptoms it is also validated and it is again four dimensional which looks at the physical social or family emotional functional well being and it has 20 simple questions which are specific to anemia and fatigue so this is how the whole flow chart of fatigue really looks like 
So first you have to have an assessment. That means so you screen the patient by using any of the thing. You use a BFI fact there for a facet or whatever. And after the screening is done, and the screening has to be done at regular intervals because the patient from the time of diagnosis you have to screen whether there is a um, already existing fatigue for with the patient because of the disease. Also, you have to screen the patient every time the patient goes in for the adjuvant therapy, the treatment, because during the phase of treatment also they can experience fatigue. And even after the completion of treatment, fatigue has to be evaluated or screened and at long term, that is survivor or even in the follow up, because this will give you a gradual idea about how long the patient's fatigue is persistent. So from the screening, you can grade the fatigue as the mild, moderate and severe. Okay, most of the scales when you see it is from the zero to three that you see in the BFI will be a mild or no fatigue. Four to six is a uh, moderate fatigue, and something from seven to ten is the severe fatigue. So whenever there is a mild fatigue or a moderate fatigue, ideally it is like you have to first educate the patient about the idea. You have to give them counseling, and you have to make them understand what fatigue is about, and so that they when they experience it, you know they will cut, get back to you. And you can start with some general strategies of fatigue management, okay, which we will see shortly. Okay, then you go for the treatment, which can be pharmacological, non-pharmacological management. We will be mainly looking at the non-pharmacological management, the pharmacological the doctors already looked into. So that comes as the primary evaluation. So after you screen, you evaluate, or you evaluate, and you identify at what level of fatigue the patient has got. What are the problems the patient is having? What are the things the patient is unable to do? And you corrective that those measures. Okay. After that is the intervention. Now intervention is where, as I told you, you have the pharmacological and the non-pharmacological, or a combination of both. There, our treatment does not end because after you give the intervention, obviously you have to re-evaluate the patient, which is the phase four. So re-evaluation is well, very important. Re-evaluation again has all these things because you have to again assess, again evaluate, again see what intervention is more applicable and then further re-evaluate the whole procedure. So the management, management strat uh, strategies are the non-pharmacological and pharmacological. Pharmacological basically like, you know, suppose if anemia, the patient is having fatigue because of the low hemoglobin, then erythropoietin stimulating agents have to be given uh, iron has to be give, given to the patients and everything. Suppose if sleep or if anxiety, depression, any of the psychological factors are there and because of which the patient is having fatigue, then there has to be some psychostimulants. So depending on medical levels, medically, what are the problems like, you know, then that has to be corrected by medicines. Now, when we see the non-pharmacological treatments, in non-pharmacological non treatments, you have exercises where physiotherapists have a role to play. It is multidimensional. So you have to have a multidisciplinary uh, measures or multidisciplinary treatment plan when it comes to treating fatigue. Because you have the CBT, which can be performed by a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And rest and sleep has to be taken care. Okay, so you develop, you teach relaxation and everything. Nutrition, very important as it as Dr. Chakur mentioned, cancer cachexia, it has to be compensated. So obviously a dietitian or nutrition should be a part of a uh, treatment uh, team of CRF. And there are some alternative medicines also that is available when you're treating cancer-related fatigue. Another important thing is like whenever for as a physiotherapist, like, you know, when you have to treat the patient, you have to ideally know at what time of the day or what time of the, which activities are the one that causes fatigue. So it is very important that the patients who are diagnosed or who are identified having fatigue should maintain a fatigue diary. So which is, a, in, I've given an example of a Rochester fatigue diary, but there are different ways of fatigue diary can be mentioned. You can put the, uh, time period like you know starting from your morning from the time the patient wakes up from that time to the patient goes to sleep you know you can put it as an one hour two hour three hour in hourly pattern also you can put it rochester diary gives you an hourly pattern it is from the time the patient wakes up in the morning to the time the patient is going to bed okay so this is the lines you know so what the patient has to do from this time in that one hour, the patient has to calculate, okay? So he has to say 
no fatigue means he will be marking it somewhere here at this end and if it is very severe fatigue the patient will draw a line at this end like you can see in the example that is given here okay so this is something that has recorded mild fatigue from 9 to 10 and the patient has got substantial fatigue from 10 to 11 in the night and this is the area when the patient is asleep from 11 to 12 okay so this is how you chart so you identify so you know at what period of time the patient is the most tired and at what period of the time the patient is the most energetic this will give you an idea of when to pace the activities or when to prioritize and put the activities so when you are talking about the energy conservation techniques this is an important thing that you have to look at when you are treating cancer related fatigue so the non pharmacological multidisciplinary treatment are like you know let's just let's concentrate on the physical activity because we are majorly physiotherapists like you know so apart from that like you know as i told you there are other alternative therapies which are there but we will not focus on that and we will just talk in terms of a physiotherapist point of view so in tmh or uh, most of the studies that show like you know they have said that a uh, physical activity of a moderate level okay a uh, moderate or a high level depending on the level of fatigue of 20 to 30 minutes of activity per day and a 3 to 5 days a week and a combination of aerobic and endurance strength training program is the important or the major line of treatment when it comes to treating crf okay this is the uh, acsm guidelines that we normally follow and the acsm guidelines that most of the studies have also mentioned about okay the thing is like you know how will you evaluate so you can evaluate the aerobic capacity by doing a step test single uh, shuttle test or a six minute walk test whatever can be permissible in your uh, scenario and you can uh, identify the functional capacity and accordingly prescribe the aerobic uh, exercises for the patient when it comes to strength training there are different ways of strength training like you can strength train the patient by using body weight you can strengthen the patient by using free weights or you can do strengthening by using the resistant bands in uh, tata hospital we normally use the resistance band we prefer using the resistance band uh, bands rather than the free weights the body weight we normally don't use for the simple reason is because like you know sometimes the patient can be in a palliative or a metastatic stage and then in those cases using your body weight again becomes a problem because of the bone mats and everything so we use a resistance band so resistant bands you look at the rpe and the rp the modified bog scale of somewhere between 4 to 6 or like between 3 to 6 also can be in the taken because that is what most of the studies mention it can be used for giving the resistance training for the patient how will you check the resistance normally ideal practice is by checking for the 1rm 1rm may not be possible in our patients so we when we are using resistance band we look at the rp and we identify and we prescribe the resistance band as per the color code to these patients and uh, we normally don't use free uh, weights uh, i told you so that is the reason like you know because you don't calculate 1rm or you simple start with a lesser weight and gradually progress okay so that is the major thing for exercise prescription now coming to the energy conservation techniques are the four p's that is you plan you pace prioritize and you position so these are the where the your the rochester diary or the fatigue diary comes into place so you can identify what activities cause uh, fatigue to the patient what time of the day is more energetic so you can pace the activities okay that means you make the patient perform the activities a high uh, energy expenditure activity at a time when he is having more energy level okay so that's how you plan and pace and prioritize apart from that then there are other uh, complementary therapies like massage can be a relaxing therapy there is acupuncture there is acupressure and there is cbt which uh, takes care about the so so psychosocial interventions nutrition compensation has to be done and uh, again cognitive behavior therapy for good sleep and of course there is reiki and yoga and other complementary therapies there are some uh you know basic uh, caution we have to follow whenever we are treating cancer patients and this is majorly because we are the ones who give the exercises we prescribe exercises so what we have to look at is we have to always look at the blood profile of the patient and these are the gu exercise guidelines that is given so when the hemoglobin is less than 8 no exercise permitted when it is between 8 to 10 light exercise is permitted 
and when it is greater than 10 you go for the resistive exercises we will look at the platelet count when it is less than 20000 no exercises when it is between 20 to 50 you either give light exercises no passive range because when you do a passive stretch you may damage and cause some kind of an internal injury or bleeding so you only concentrate on the light active assisted range of motion or active range of motion is permitted when greater than 50000 you can obviously go for resistive exercises in all these other things only adl is allowed when the wbc that is when the patient is having fever obviously there is some infection so you give no exercises and when the patient wbc is greater than 5000 you can start with light exercises also other factors like nausea vomiting giddiness if at all it persists then as per the patient's uh, tolerance you can give exercises or you can go or refrain from exercises one caution i have missed to add in this slide but i would like to tell is because since we are dealing with cancer and we may be looking at an uh, advanced cancer so there may be some kind of a skeletal metastasis involved so whenever you are giving prescription you also rule out and you look at the pet ct if available look out look look to see where the metastatic deposits are before you before you are giving the exercise prescription because suppose if it's a weight bearing joint then you are walking and other things like you know you may have given aid to the patient to off, offload the weighted joints to prevent a fracture or a uh, damage to the bones and suppose if the spinal if the vertebras are involved then probably you may have to give some kind of an orthosis that has to be uh you know protected i mean the spine has to be supported before you can really progress to exercises for these patients so these are some of the guidelines and uh, some of the care and caution you have to follow when you are dealing with your cancer related fatigue and uh, these are the references which i already mentioned in my first slide there are a lot of studies involved and uh, still there are there is scope for more research where cancer related fatigue is concerned because uh, cancer is a disease like you know which majorly uh, gives this kind of a complication and more than 80% of the patient are affected and uh, intervention or timely identification and intervention is very much important when you are dealing with cancer related fatigue so with that i end my talk and uh, thank you for listening Ah, thank you, Doctor uh, Anuradha, ma'am. And uh, kindly keep your questions for, for her. And for all, you can put it in the chat box now itself, so that at the end of the session, we will have the question answers.